Hello and welcome to Marketing Monday Wins and Fails Democracy in Action Edition. We are in the middle of the greatest year of elections in human history. More people will vote this year than in any year in human history, over half of the world's population. And today, we just had one of our most contested ones yet. I take you, of course, to the world of Russia. Now, if you watch Russian television, as I'm sure you've all done, you may have seen this ad. Помыл. А маму мою с днем рождения не забыл поздравить? Конечно, не забыл. А проголосовать заехал? Нет, не успел. Солнышко, да какая разница? Без нас не выберут, что ли? Ты хочешь нашего ребенка без материнского капитала оставить? А нас? Без семейной ипотеки? А деньги на свой бизнес ты где собрался брать? Без льготного кредита обойдешься, а? Я успею. Я успею. Я успею. It's very important to vote in these Russian elections and these TV ads made it very clear. We want the highest turnout in Russian election history and they got it. You know, with an all-star cast of candidates, everyone needed to get out and vote to find the best of the best. We had an unforgettable election. Pro-war songwriters sang in front of the polling booths. We had the ability after you cast your vote to get a photo with a Tucker Carlson cardboard cutout. We had we had cartoon characters voting. We had Barbie voting. We had Spider-Man voting. And of course, we had newlyweds who left the altar to make sure they voted right after getting married. And we had some light arson. A couple bombs and some people that were uh, breaking in and dumping ink over all of the ballots. After all of that, all of that amazing contested election, a surprise result. Out of nowhere, the dark horse of the race, an unknown in Russian politics, Vladimir Putin won with a mere 87.3% of the vote. Amazing! And for some reason, journalistic institutions don't believe that this was a fully fair election. They call it preordained and say it was the result of crackdowns on his opponents. Specifically, they bring up this guy, Alexander Navalny, who was the leading opposition candidate to Vladimir Putin, who died in prison before the election. Uh, it is suspected that he was killed in prison, though Russia denies this, Putin denies this, and in fact, went on TV after his death and after winning the election and said that his death was sad, but such is life. In fact, he specifically said that people die in prisons, it happens. <laughs> He also said, this is an insane part of his speech. He goes, I was this close to letting him out. I was, I was gonna trade him for someone else and he's gonna be out and free to go. Which is like, damn, what an unfortunate timing right before the election. Um, his wife, the wife of the Navalny who died, organized some protests against Putin. They were detained. A lot of people, hundreds of people involved in the protests were detained. And outside of that, it wasn't really a lot of um, controversy. Again, all of, the, all of the people that protested at polls against Putin, many of them were detained. And state media said, those those provocations at polling stations were nothing more than mosquito bites. Putin is cemented into power for another six years after ruling uh, consecutively since 1999. One of the longest running uh, leaders of a powerful nation in the world. Actually, I think he is. So before I jump into his incredibly long rule, his record setting rule, I do wanna take a moment to show this very funny Russian prank YouTuber <laughs> who put up a poster in the building of Putin in the elevator and recorded their authentic authentic actual responses to seeing it. <laughs> anyway, maybe behind the scenes, not 100% uh, as popular as it seems in the polls, but Putin forever is the title of this. And it basically serves to say that now that he has gone from 2024 to 2030, he will now pass Joseph Stalin's time in office and become the longest serving Russian leader in the 20th century. And I wanna go back through how long, I think if, you, if you're watching now, you may not fully understand how long Vladimir Putin has been the single ruler of Russia. It goes back to 1999. 
2009 when he first took office. The number one movie the year Vladimir Putin took office was Star Wars Episode One. Here is him butting heads literally with Bill Clinton. Then here's him again with George W. Bush smiling and laughing uh, when the number one movie was Shrek 2. It is worth to stay on this slide and say that George Bush said, I looked into his eyes, I looked into his soul and I saw a good man. You could tell maybe in this photo, that's, that's his peak happy Putin. I've never seen him smile so much. Then his third term, here's him with Obama. And the number one movie was The Dark Knight. Here's him <laughs> with Trump when the number one movie was Zootopia. Here's him looking as sad as possible next to Biden. <laughs> Just fucking, just miserable when Black Widow was the number one movie, which of course that makes sense. And now that brings us to today where the number one movie is Dune 2 and he has renewed his uh, hold on power for six more years and also created incredibly weird headlines like this one. Putin extends his rule over Russia and Dune Part 2 out earns entire run of first film. A real headline from NBC News. <laughs> Just split those stories. But looking to the future, I would like to say that because of the way the Russian constitution has been set up because of Vladimir Putin, he has the ability to run for another term to 2036. Because in 2030, when his six year term is up, he will only be 77 years old, which is as old as Trump is right now and younger than Biden is right now. So there's a very good chance he could make it to 2030 and run for another six year run into 2036, which of course will be when Hollow Knight Silk Song comes out as a movie slash game experience that we can all enjoy. So looking forward to that. Now, what does this mean? Six more years guaranteed essentially of Vladimir Putin. So who is happy about Putin getting six more years? Well, there's one guy. Xi Jinping doing shots with him. <laughs> China is happy about Putin locking in six more years. And that is for a lot of reasons. He called him after his reelection and said, your reelection fully reflected the support of the Russian people. China will promote the sustained and in-depth development of the two country strategic partnership. Basically what Xi Jinping is very happy about is that because Putin has pissed off Europe and no longer can sell them natural gas and oil, all of it goes to China. <laughs> this is why he is very happy. Uh, we will be following up on all of this, but so far, not a incredible news coming out of the war in Ukraine and Russia. However, some very funny news did come out of somewhere a little closer to home, and that is the jail that SPF is staying in. Now, SPF <laughs> is going to get a win from me for creative thinking. Now, you might know Sam Megman Freed. He was put in jail for supporting TSM. That was his major crime, nothing else, nothing for stealing customer funds. And now he sits in jail arguing for his release and arguing that he could make his customers whole. But what recently came out is really hilarious. During the court proceedings, they found a Google Doc of all of his ideas <laughs> on how to get people to like him and turn his public image around before he went to jail. The first one is just blame the lawyers. Blame the lawyers, throw them under the bus, say that it was all the lawyers' fault, which is kind of what he did. At number 15, way down the list, is try radical honesty. <laughs> Crazy to have 14 ideas before just tell the truth is on there. He said, blame it all on Binance come out with a strong anti-Binance message and then probably the funniest one is that he should go on Tucker Carlson come out as Republican <laughs> and come out against the woke agenda <laughs> his last one send out a Twitter poll and just ask people what to do <laughs> The end of the day, none of this worked and he ended up in jail, but it was fun to see this plan. Uh, another win in the world of scamming goes in the world of high-end expensive wine. Well, there's a guy right here, the $9.5 million hangover. So uh, again, the classic uh, scam in the wine world is that you take a very expensive bottle of wine and you replace the interior with cheap wine and you sell that at a massive markup. You lie about the, the quality of the wine, some rich person buys it, they can't taste the difference, easy. This guy had a much more classy and sophisticated scam. He would charge rich people to drink wine with him because of how good his storytelling and guestmanship was. He would organize elaborate and expensive wine parties and invite a bunch of rich people and you had to pay thousands of dollars to attend and you would crack open a bottle of $100,000 wine. Everyone would drink it and talk and tell stories and have a good time. I would drop anything to go to one of Omar's dinners. The only thing was he could not afford these dinners <laughs> that he was putting on. And what he was doing was he was getting outside investors to put up the money and promising them a cut of the profits. 
people from all over would offer him millions of dollars to set up these parties. And he would lie to them, fly to different countries and keep it going. This scheme went on for a very long time because as it turns out, rich people, if they get scammed, don't want to talk about it. <laughs> And if they talk about it, they seem like fools. <laughs> so this guy just basically preyed on rich people, took a bunch of money from them, and then finally some rich person lost enough money, they asked about it and they they, they brought up the scheme. And now he has been uh, arrested and fined 9.5 million pounds for scamming them. Uh, one thing I wanna say about his backstory though that I thought was really funny, during his time at Oxford, he would tell stories to friends and family about how he would confound professors during lectures. How he was so smart and how he was so smart he made the, the pressures look stupid. And then finally at graduation, the grades were released and he was bottom of the class, at which point he disappeared. So he's been scamming from an early age. So I have to give him a dub here because while I am not normally in support of scammers, I think this guy scammed only egotistical rich people. This guy made it work despite bad grades and a love of drinking. <laughs> Speaking of someone else who's getting untold amounts of dubs lately, let's give it up to Jensen Huang, my former boss. Editor put in the clip of uh, Jensen Huang saying, and now next, my good friend, Brandon. Brandon and GeForce Marketing will now show you. Jensen Huang had a presentation today at GTC. I would love to show you a quick clip from it because it's very funny. Uh, and it reminds me of my time working there. I hope you realize this is not a concert. That's the main thing I wanted to show, which is that <laughs> this was a much bigger crowd than he usually has. With the rise of Nvidia stock to all time highs, people have become Nvidia fans in ways they weren't before. And this conference is two hours of him yapping about science and microchips. And a lot of people were here cheering and hoping it would be like all cool. This reminds me, we held something similar in Germany. We held a big announcement speech and we put him up on stage in front of like 200 gamers and streamers that we had flown in. And he yapped about like the details of RTX technology. And they were literally falling asleep at their tables. <laughs> A similar thing was uh, possibly about to happen here at GTC where he said, hey, this is not a concert. He went into it. Uh, he guy knows his stuff and they announced a lot of things. The one that is important to you was this, the Blackwell uh, platform for trillion parameter scale generative AI, the sequel to the H100. They've been selling like hotcakes for 50 grand a pop. They now have the B200 and that is going to be their new flagship AI chip. Assuming this continues what worked with the H100, it will be very profitable for Nvidia and is their plan to maintain dominance and a lead in the AI chip marketplace. And so far so good. However, what I found so interesting, despite this big announcement, is that it was so priced in. <laughs> Market did not respond gives a slight indication that perhaps the, the speculation, the greed, the hyping up of everything leading into this has gotten to the point where there's no additional bump. We'll see. I mean, we, there's a few more days for this to sink in, for the, the implications to sink in. But now that being said, there is still no challenger. Uh, we'll follow up and see how that goes. Speaking of big money, there's another person you may know. His name is Jimmy Beast, and he has made major news this week with a major win. Now, we all know Jimmy Beast makes a gazillion dollars off of uh, selling chocolate to kids and putting out 100 million view videos every single day. But what you don't know is that he just signed a $100 million deal with Amazon Prime to make his first TV show. He is now going to be creating The Beast Games, a $5 million game show that's gonna go live in 236 countries at once on Amazon Prime. A pretty insane deal in the creator economy that nobody else has come close to in the entire history of the creator economy. It is expected to be bigger than Netflix's version of Squid Game. He literally went from copying Netflix's Squid Game for a YouTube video to beating their actual Squid Game with his own game show. If this takes off, it could lead to a flurry of contracts for big creators to create content for platforms like Netflix, Prime, etc. On the negative side, on the fail, I want to do a small discussion of the last days of the Boeing whistleblower, which is an article that came out that I thought was very powerful. And I don't want to go too deeply into it, but it's pretty tragic. Definitely confirms to me that there was some sort of, at least a strong, strong implication of foul play. To give a little background, his name's John Barnett. And he had been a worker at Boeing for decades and made many, many complaints 
complaints as to the quality of the work being done, the lack of safety procedures. And what he would do is he would write all this stuff down. He was very meticulous about writing down uh, these process violations. And his managers reprimanded him for that. Do not put your problems in writing, which is very fucking grim. This caused him, you know, stress, panic attacks, problems. They isolated him. So they took him off his job that he loved and put him away from other workers in like the back of the factory doing the most menial tasks. They tried everything to like punish him in ways that would show up legally. And finally, when he realized that all of his complaints were going nowhere and getting filed in the trash can, he finally put in official whistleblower complaint. And that's where he did his official testimony the day before his death. He did four hours of, of testifying, four hours of questioning, following seven hours of cross-examination by Boeing's lawyers. He was happy to be telling his side of the story, excited to be fielding questions, doing a great job. And the guy's saying, this is the best witness I've ever seen. <laughs> He's reciting the details of incidents from a decade ago with specific dates without looking at documents. So the guy's absolutely giga chat. He's crushing. He's the perfect witness to show Boeing's crimes. And he is due to do follow-up testimony. Boeing's lawyers demand, instead of him driving home for the weekend like he planned to and continuing testimony in two weeks, that he finish his testimony and now and stay for an extra day. That extra day, when they're calling him to show up for that testimony, they find out he's dead. Now that is fucking suspicious. <laughs> A man who had the day before been excited and doing excellent job testimony shows up dead the next day after being detained by Boeing's lawyer's request. So all of this adds up to me be thinking it's not much of a conspiracy theory to say that this guy, there is something foul afoot in his death. Uh, and I did like this. Because if a Boeing employee wants the whistle blow, they obviously can. But the thing is, they're not going to blow the whistle because of the implication. Uh, even the implication that they have to kill is fucking insane. Now... You guys decide if the next one's a winner or a fail. You know self-checkout machines. They exist for one reason, which is that companies, no matter what they say, created these so they could fire people. They would like to get rid of some of their employees. Well, it turns out that they're also very, very good for casual theft. The casual theft of it has added up to the point where now all of these companies are rolling back basically all of their self-checkout plans. So at the very least, it's more people hired. I don't know if this is a win or a fail if you really love stealing. <laughs> Speaking of things that don't work, let's talk about Apple. Now I mentioned, <laughs> I mentioned in a previous Marketing Monday that Apple is going through some tougher times. Their China problems are piling up. Basically the iPhone sales are dropping in China, which is a big market for them. The Apple Vision Pro is not exactly out of the gate a hit. They canceled their $10 billion Apple car. They don't have anything big coming out. And so they've been banking on AI, but now it is seeming like Apple is not even close to ready to having anything actually cool to say about AI. So they announced very recently that they're just basically partnering with Google to take whatever Google has and put it on their phones. They're putting Google's Gemini on Apple phones as early as June or July to get something AI related related onto Apple phones as soon as possible. Now, this is not great news for Apple, the fact that they don't have anything ready, but it is great news for Google, which needed a win in the AI space and could lead to their victory. Again, one of the main things that keeps Google search so dominant is that they pay a few billion dollars a year to be the only search platform or the, the default search platform on Apple iPhones. And if they get to the point where their AI is now default for Apple, this could really cut open AI and Microsoft out of the picture again. It was positive in the stock a little bit for Apple, very much for Google. And of course, as always, anything that has AI in it is good for NVIDIA, but does throw a wrench into, into Microsoft's plans that Google finally got a, a dub in this space. Now, I want to go back to this one question. Apple's China problems are piling up. And the only thing that brings me to say is what the hell is going on in China? What's up, Beijing? What's up, Beijing is back. And today's top story out of China concerns tourism. Basically, China has a problem. The airports are empty because people don't want to go there and people don't want to stay there. The number of expats living in China from South Korea, Japan, UK, and France has dropped. All four countries, it has dropped between 2019 and 2023. And so the main plan is for Xi Jinping to smile and go on a charm offensive. Xi Jinping, look at this Riz, dude. This dude is going to win you back. China, 
turns on the charm, but its allure has faded. Basically, there are a lot of plans now rolling out to try and get tourism back into China, which has, which has waned in recent years. But first, there's two sides to this coin. People not going to China as much is true, but also Chinese tourists aren't leaving China as much. And in fact, they're choosing more often to do domestic tourism, which is like a sky high wave. People in China are having tourism all over China, different parts of China, like Americans visiting New York or something. They're, they're visiting all over China. But inbound tourism, other countries, is falling short of expectations. That is not doing so much. And so they're trying to turn that around. Now, there's already one cool reason to go, which is this Twitch clip I saw the other day of a dude walking his robot dog through Shanghai, I believe. <laughs> But their plans are to offer visa-free entry for citizens of France, Germany, Italy, the Netherlands, Spain, Malaysia. We've mentioned this before. They are opening up the ability to visa-free travel from a bunch of European countries. Switzerland uh, has unilateral visa-free treatment, backwards and forwards. Ireland, unilateral visa-free treatment, deepening bilateral ties. Singapore and China have a visa-free deal for up to 30 days. Thailand have visa-free. I mean, China is going country to country and basically signing deals to make tourism very, very easy for these countries to go back and forth. Also, they opened up this island, which is Hainan, which is basically the Hawaii of China, which is now visa-free travel for everyone. So if you don't wanna go to mainland China and you only wanna go to this island, you can't leave it. You can only go in and out. Even America can go visa-free. 59 countries can go visa-free and can go to the Chinese Hawaii, which is pretty incredible. Now you, can, you can't leave. You can't like, you can't like get into Hainan and then go this way. And they pledge further methods. So again, one thing that I've noticed as I've researched for a China trip is that as a foreigner, when you get to China, it's very hard to get set up on their payment apps they use for everything. They're making it easier. So they're doing some real actual helpful things to make it easier for tourists. And they plan to expand more scope. So again, while the, the reasoning for this is obvious, but the fact that they're doing it is at least a good sign. And also, you may know Panda Express as a pretty nasty fast food place that I don't really enjoy. But there's also a real Panda Express that carries pandas back and forth between America and China. And the Panda Express is fired up, baby, because for the first time in decades, China is pledging a brand new pair of pandas back to America. The era of panda diplomacy, which we had just less than a year ago, where they were pulling all their pandas back, is over. And they are extending an olive branch to send a pair of pandas back to the United States for the first time in two decades, the San Diego Zoo will receive the descendants of two of the former, of Bayan and Gao to the zoo's former residents. So hashtag good news. Now, uh, the last story didn't really fit in anywhere else, but it was so funny that I had to tell you. It's actually a little bit old, it's a few months old. There is a beer brand in China called Sing Tao. This is the beer brand. They're like the sixth largest beer producer in the world. They uh, have a huge market in China and then also in neighboring countries like Japan and South Korea. Not too long ago, maybe a couple months ago, one of the workers of Sing Tao, let me see if I can find this video, took a video of himself standing on the edge of one of the beer vats, walking over to it and pissing in the beer. <laughs> I cannot tell you how bad of a marketing disaster this was for this company. They had to do many, many, many apologies and, and uh, promises that that was quarantined immediately and that nobody pisses in the beer. But of course, you know, the way the internet works, now there's a lot of jokes about it. Uh, like the beer tastes like piss because there's piss in it. <laughs> While this didn't really fit anywhere, I thought it was one of the ultimate marketing fails that happens in China. But that's the end of What's Up Beijing and that's the end of today's Marketing Monday. Hope you enjoyed that recap of some business wins and fails from the past week and tune in every week for even more. Check it, check it.